Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to the Abu Dhabi Surgical Pathology Journal Club. Uh, we are here today to discuss uh, a very hot topic uh, in pathology and oncology, uh, which is about the HER2 and the um, establishment of HER2 law. Uh, today with us, we have uh, our uh, speaker, Prof. Abir Shaban. I'm really honored to have her. Uh, she is a specialist uh, breast pathologist at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Birmingham, and honorary senior lecturer at the University of uh, Birmingham. Um, she uh, she was trained in anatomical pathology in Liverpool and Birmingham and in Leeds, and she completed her PhD in molecular pathology at the University of Liverpool. Uh, she led a number of research and trials um, as a co-investigator. A member of the trial management group and as a central pathology reviewer. Uh, she was a member of the uh, uh, NCRI breast uh, uh, CSG for two terms and acted as a chair of the translational subgroup uh, for five years. And she had more than 110 peer reviewed papers and uh, contributed a number of uh, uh, book chapters, including the WHO, uh, um, the Blue Book of uh, for the Breast Tumor in 2019. Um, uh, Dr. Shaban organizes the annual multidisciplinary breast update course, and she lectured in a number of UK uh, and international courses and conferences. So without any further ado, let's welcome Prof. Abir. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Alia, for that kind introduction. Um, I hope you can uh, see my slides now. Yeah, we can. A very good afternoon to all of you from Birmingham. So uh, that's where I am now. This is uh, Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Birmingham, which is the largest um, hospital university affiliated in Birmingham. And I am also affiliated to the University of Birmingham. This is our very famous clock tower. Um, and this is Birmingham on a very nice uh, sunny day. Doesn't happen that often. Uh, so, and these are both on the same campus in the same area. So today uh, I'm really uh, pleased to be with you uh, to, to talk about um, HER2 low breast cancer, which is, as you know, a very important and a very evolving topic uh, for pathologists and oncologists alike. Just before I, uh, I start, this is my conflict of interest, um, nothing uh, that impacts on the presentation for today. Um, and um, since this is uh, AstraZeneca sponsored, the, this is uh, the pharmaceutical marketing practice code, and this is the information on reporting adverse events uh, or product quality complaints. So for testing of HER2 expression in breast cancer, we have so many tests. Some of them uh, include protein expression, some uh, based on DNA, some are RNA. But the one that we use uh, daily as pathologists is the immunohistochemistry. So looking for strong membrane uh, positivity for HER2. And it is quantitative. And we also use it because it allows morphological correlation. So for example, we exclude DCIS from our scoring. We can tell the quality. Uh, for example, normal breast should be negative. DCIS is often positive, uh, but is excluded from the scoring. It's fast, cheap, and reproducible. So which is the best test? We know that we use fish as well in cytohybridization of various types for HER2. A diagnostic test should be accurate and reproducible and also precise. So if we test it, if we test the same sample several times in several labs, we should get the same results. Ideally, it should be correlated with information on response to therapy. Some uh, recommend using in situ hybridization actually for uh, HER2 because it is less affected by fixation issues. So if that tumor is not optimally fixed, fish is normally more stable than protein expression. 
Um, in the UK guidelines, we start with immunohistochemistry followed by FISH. And I think that's a standard everywhere. ASCO-GAP guidelines in 2018 started with FISH, then protein expression. It's very important to focus on standardization and quality control in the test that you're doing, whether it is immunohistochemistry or in cyto hybridization. We're all familiar with our four categories of uh, HER2 scoring, zero, one plus, two plus, which is the equivocal. And this is a group that we uh, then confirm by further tests for HER2 gene amplification and ratio and then HER2 3 plus, which is a positive. And for decades, we have been focusing on selecting this group, the HER2 positive, and the positives out of the 2 plus. And for the negative ones, because there was no treatment for them, we really didn't bother. So many places didn't even bother to um, comment whether the score was zero or one, you would just call it negative. Um, this is uh, no longer acceptable. Um, so we have been testing in the UK on all breast cancer prospectively since 2005. Testing is done mainly on core biopsies, um, and we repeat in particular indications. Uh, we start with immunohistochemistry and do fish testing or D-DISH or SISH, whatever test you're using, uh, on equivocal cases. These are the borderlines, the two plus cases and about 20% of them will turn out to be amplified. Um, in the UK, there's appro approximately 79 uh, IHC testing centers and 40 fish testing labs. So uh, some places like where I work, we test our own cases, but we are also referral center for um, the West Midlands region, and we receive uh, requests for immunist chemistry and fish testing from various hospitals. Uh, overall, about 13% of all cases tested are HER2 positive, and for cases tested by FISH, about 17% amplified, and this is data from the UK NICWAS. All the data in the literature so far um, has shown that core biopsy is reliable and safe to test HER2 on, and there is a very high degree of correlation between HER2 core biopsy results and excision results. Um, and this is some data to show you the percentage concordance. And as you see, mostly over 90%. This is our own paper that showed 96% concordance and less concordance after new adjuvant chemotherapy, but still above 90%. So what are the uh, reasons for discordance in HER2 results between core biopsy and excision? Several reasons. It could be pre-analytical, inadequate or prolonged fixation. And this is more likely to affect the big specimens. So surgical specimens are less likely, are more likely to be um, uh, inadequately fixed if they are not received on time and dealt with quickly. And that's why core biopsies are an advantage in that context. They are small, fixed quickly. So the results on cores are usually reliable. It could be inter-observer variation, so pathologist factor. It could be due to post-treatment. And we have data to show that uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy and new adjuvant endocrine therapy can lead to change in ER, PR, and HER2 status. If you have a limited amount of invasive tumor on core biopsy, um, it's advisable to repeat and assess a large amount or tumor heterogeneity. And that's an example of cluster tumor heterogeneity where most of the tumor is completely negative and you have an area, a clone, that is strongly positive. So this can lead to discordance. Um, heterogeneity can be uh, intermingled like this. So you can, you can uh, have these two patterns. They can be quite uh, in contact with each other or can be completely different clones. And you can see also the... Um, heterogeneity in fish testing. So this is the same case that showed uh, two areas. The area that was uh, three plus um, histo um, by immunohistochemistry was actually fish amplified and the rest was not. 
So this is a, a review that we did recently on receptor change after new adjuvant chemotherapy, if you want to read more about the reasons and, and the proportions. So changed in ER, okay. HER2 is less frequently changed compared with PR. And uh, FISH is generally more stable. So if you do FISH uh, and immunohistochemistry, you can get more immunohistochemistry discordance than FISH. And the triple negative breast cancer is the most stable molecular profile that is uh, unlikely to change after treatment. So these are the indications for repeat testing. So if you start with core biopsy, and that's the recommended, uh, you can repeat in particular indications. If there were technical issues in the core biopsy, for example, inadequate tissue, minimal tumor sample, crushed cells, difficult to interpret, um, if we have recurrent or metastatic disease, we would normally biopsy and repeat testing. If there are multiple clones, heterogeneity, so you can uh, repeat. Or if you, for example, in the excision, identify more primary tumors. For example, you had a mucinous cancer on core, and then you found another ductal NST cancer on excision. That's when we should repeat because that's a separate primary tumor or a different morphology on excision. It's recommended to repeat in the borderline fish results that the around the border of two ratio, because uh, looking at more cells can um, push the result either into the negative or the positive category. And following treatment, uh, new adjuvant chemo and in resistant cases. So following treatment is done in many places, but it's not currently mandated in the pathology guidelines. And it's important to participate in a quality assurance scheme for the staining and for the interpretation. And in the UK, our system is called uh, the UK National External Quality Assurance Scheme, UK NIQAS. And in this scheme, we get unstained sections. Every lab would get that. Uh, and we include positive, and this includes positive and negative cell lines. Uh, and we also provide our own sections with the staining and we send them to be assessed by the NICWAS expert team. And if a lab gets consecutive two inappropriate results, they get a warning letter and they get technical advice and support. And if further two uh, for, um, rounds with inappropriate scores, the lab is removed from UK NICWAS and would no longer be able to test for HER2. Interestingly, that's available internationally as well. So if you want to join uh, UK NIQAS, you can, um, uh, with a fee, obviously. And um, uh, there is a pilot scheme now, which is an educational scheme for the HER2 low breast cancer, if you're interested. So to make sure that we get it right, every lab testing for HER2 should be testing adequate number of cases. And that's really important because it maintains the experience. It makes you see all the ranges of possible uh, permutations of staining. And in the UK, uh, it is recommended that labs would do at least 200 breast cancer cases to be allowed to set up their own immunohistochemistry testing. Uh, standardized methodology, validated controls, and lab accreditation. Um, one note about testing on metastatic cancer, particularly bone metastasis. Obviously, we test HER2 on um, a number of metastatic lesions, uh, liver, lung, uh, skin. Uh, but metastasis to bone can be a bit tricky because of the decalcification that happens before we do uh, the immunohistochemistry. So data su supports that um, we should avoid having strong uh, acids to do the decalcification, something like nitric acid, so avoid that. And uh, editor is the recommended um, um, decalcification method to preserve the immunohistochemistry and fish and again, fish is more stable than immunohistochemistry in this instance. This is an example of metastatic breast cancer to bone, one of our own cases, MNF positive, so confirming epithelial malignancy, and this was uh, HER2 2 plus, uh, fish positive. In addition to getting it right, we need to get the results very, very quickly to the treating uh, oncologist. And we need that 
on the core biopsy to uh, inform decisions on new adjuvant chemotherapy um, for trials and for subsequent adjuvant treatments, uh, also for recurrent and metastatic disease. We did some work before on um, the turnaround time and reasons for delays. And one of the main re reasons was batching of requests. So basically for the lab to wait till they have a number of cases and then batch them to the referring hospital. This takes a lot of time. Transport as well, if you move blocks from one place to the other. Uh, lack of communication or poor communication with the re reference lab and staff shortages. Um, and if you map it, if you batch, if you send by uh, transport, uh, if you do fish, generally it takes at least another week to get the results. And posting back the results, so we therefore recommend having a server or uh, a secure um, um, NHS email, for example, to receive the results. There are other tests that can be quicker than FISH, and this is what we call D-DISH, uh, dual um, chromogen, uh, dual haptogen in cytohybridization. And this is uh, a bright field method, similar to FISH, but you basically look down the microscope. Beauty of it is that you can use it on the Ventana machine as well. Um, permanent staining doesn't fade, doesn't uh, need a dark background. Uh, so some places use that as well and is, um, if you have experience with fish, you will find this easy as well. And uh, there is some guidance um, in the literature about how to achieve fast turnaround time for HER2 testing. And these are like three separate pathways to so choose what works for you. It doesn't have to be identical in every place. It's what works for your own uh, local environment. So regarding uh, scoring, and uh, I understand you use the ASCO CAP guidelines, and there has been um, a number of uh, changes to the uh, guidelines. We originally started with 10% cutoff for H uh, IHC positivity, followed by 30, then we went back to 10% with some indication of repeat testing. 2018, we went back to 10% to, uh, and starting with FISH then IHC, and the latest ASCOCAP guidelines have just been published as well, uh, 2023. I just wanted to highlight a bit of a difference between the UK and the uh, ASCOCAP guidelines in this particular group. So in 2013, ASCOCAP guidelines, uh, specimens that have ratio of more than two, but HER2 copy number less than four by fish, were considered positive for management purposes, and those patients would receive anti-HER2 therapy. And that's what we followed in the UK as well. In the 2018 guidelines, this fell into group two, with average um, her two copy number less than four, but ratio more than two, which is this one. So this actually, um, the recommendation was to do further tests, but the conclusion is to call it her two negative with comment. And that's something that we felt in the UK that was not justified. We didn't have evidence for it. Um, we've always used either the ratio or um, copy number more than six. To, um, to indicate positivity. So we uh, decided to um, gather some evidence to see if we should follow this guidance or not. And we had a multi-center UK audit of uh, cases that had received new adjuvant chemotherapy and anti-HER2 therapy that fell into this group, the group two, and also compared it with group three and other groups uh, in the ASCOCAP guidelines. So as we expected, the cases that were straightforward, three plus positive, had the highest PCR rate. The two plus fish amplified were 27. And this group two actually was very similar to the two plus fish amplified and higher than the rest of the groups that are less than ratio of two. So that's why the UK guidelines did not change and did not follow the um, ASCO CAP guidelines in this particular group. So that's group two, ratio more than two, 
but uh, her to copy number um, less than four. So we still call them positive and those patients in the UK would get anti-HER2 therapy based on the ratio. So for us, the fish is either more than two ratio or a HER2 copy number more than six. That either is enough to call positive. So that's basically the ASCO CAP 2013 guidelines. And does it matter whether you draw the line? It does. This is a really nice letter that looked at 100 cases of stained by HER2 using the ASCO CAP guidelines uh, in its various uh, reiterations. So that's in, if you use the 2007, that's if you use the 2013, and that's 2018. And it classifies cases as positive and negative differently, depending on your cutoff value. So if we move to the topic of today's um, HER2 low breast cancer. So the definition of HER2 low breast cancer is any HER2 score one plus or two plus fish negative. So one plus or two plus, but fish negative, like this case, uh, would all be under the umbrella of HER2 low breast cancer. It is a sizable proportion of breast cancer, about half of what we see, and it's a heterogeneous population. It includes both ER positive cancer and ER negative cancer. So both luminal and triple negative breast cancer would fall into the uh, HER2 low breast cancer. So why are we drawn into it now? Why, why is all the fuss about the HER2 low breast cancer? It all comes from the new trials that have shown that cases that had very low levels of expression of HER2 still responded well to uh, therapy, new therapy. So this is the uh, DESTINY breast 4 trial that showed doubling of the progression-free survival for patients that received the TDXD treatment, which is a type of antibody drug conjugate for HER2 low. It, it's actually licensed for HER2 positive breast cancer, but also affects the HER2 low breast cancer. It's mainly for the hormone receptors. The trial had a smaller number of triple negatives, but showed the same value. So that's very exciting and, and very novel and novel for us as pathologists as well. So what's TDXD, it, which is trastuzumab, deroxytican, or the, um, the uh, commercial name is in HER2. It's a novel HER2 targeted antibody drug conjugate. So it doesn't work in the same way as Herceptin. Um, it, it delivers topoisomerase 1 inhibitor conjugate to the HER2 expressing cells. And you will hear a lot of uh, uh, oncologists uh, talking about payload. It has a very high drug to antibody ratio. So it's almost like a carrier. It carries a drug to the cells and at a very high concentration compared with the other anti-HER2 therapy. In addition to that, it also has what we call a bystander effect. So it would affect a cell, the cell would die and would release the, the drug into the surrounding cells, even if those cells are not HER2 positive or have very low level. So it would affect the um, HER2 positive cells and the cells with very low levels of expression with very minimal effect on normal breast tissue. So there are several HER2 low trials ongoing the Destiny 04. Destiny 06 is uh, ongoing now, and we, we're eagerly awaiting the results. Uh, so this includes HER2 low or ultra low. So what's ultra low breast cancer? Uh, you know HER2 zero um, doesn't, have, doesn't have to be completely negative. HER2 zero is um, when you have a weak or faint expression less than 10%. So if it is less than 10%, it still has a bit of expression, but very low to reach the threshold of one plus. So those cases are called HER2 ultra low. That's to differentiate them from the completely negative where there is no staining at all. That's the true zero or what's called now HER2 null, no, no staining whatsoever. So ultra low has a bit of expression, but below the threshold of the one plus. Um, 
and uh, there is the DAISY trial, which looked at HER2 low and HER2 zero as well. So that's why as pathologists, we now have to refine our definition of what we call positive, negative, HER2 low and ultra low. So this is some data that was presented in ESMO 2022, uh, showing uh, the, from the DAISY trial, showing the uh, partial response in blue and complete response in green uh, for cases that are HER2 positive, and that's, as you see, a lot of response. HER2 low have a reasonable response, but interestingly, also HER2 negative, that's a zero, still showing partial response here in some of the cases. So we await the results of the um, DESTINY 06, which will explore that as well to tell us whether as pathologists, um, we need to separate the HER2 low from the negative, so that's one plus from the zero, or actually just say the zero is the null, not at all, and, and separated from the rest. So this is why there is still uncertainty about where to draw the line, which, uh, which type of um, HER2 low expression does respond or doesn't respond. And data from the DAISY trial showed that the drug actually can, uh, is, is mainly uh, affecting the HER2 positive cells, but also seen at low levels in the HER2 negative cells. There is a lot of work about the heterogeneity and how far the cells should be uh, from each other for the drug to be active. So this is still um, ongoing. So for us as pathologists, we no longer see HER2 as a, a binary uh, classification, positive or negative. There is a spectrum now from the zero to the three plus, but for the purpose of identifying patients suitable for HER2 low breast cancer treatment, we need to identify this group. So this is a group of one plus or two plus HER2 non-amplified. So now the positives will be the 3 plus and the 2 plus amplified as previously, that's HER2 positive, but we now need to get the spectrum right. So it becomes crucial now to separate what we call zero from one plus. So to distinguish this uh, group of HER2 low breast cancer. So how, how uh, good are we as pathologists in selecting or identifying the HER2 low group. Uh, there is limited data in the literature still on that. So this is one poster that was presented in ASCO 2021 uh, that looked at thousands of samples and found that if you do them in um, local hospital and then you review the staining and interpretation in central hospitals, you. You, there is a lot of variation. So the concordance was 70% for locally tested and only 40% uh, for the two plus um, cases. Out of these cases, they selected 500 samples where they did two tests on them, the Ventana 4B5 and the Hercept test. So they did the Ventana and Daco stains and looked at the proportion of HER2 low by each assay. They found that the 28% um, were HER2 low using the 4B5 assay compared with only uh, just under 12% using the Hercept test. So the tests are not, um, are not identical. They wouldn't select the same group. And they also found that the 4B assay classed several patients' uh, tumors as 1 plus, 2 plus, that were actually zero by the Hercep test, but almost all patients that were IHC zero by the 4B5 were also um, zero by uh, the Hercep test. So this, this more, more or less favors the 4B5 um, antibody as selecting a larger group of uh, HER2 low breast cancer. But remember that DACO have also developed their Hercep test and actually provided now a new monoclonal antibody that they think um, would select more, will identify more HER2 low breast cancers. 
So this is just to show you the data on the comparison between the Ventana 4B5 and the DAC coercive test. And the data in the literature is conflicting, really. So this was a study that uh, looked at uh, 119 cancers. They found a very high concordance between uh, both, if you call positive or negative, uh, but um, the HER2 low was not as good. So 35% versus 19, and this concluded that Hercept test actually classified more cases as HER2 2 plus uh, when compared with the 4B5. Completely the opposite uh, data found in, in this um, study. So watch this space. I think we need more data. And both tests are validated. Both tests um, are used in clinical practice. Uh, but the uh, Ventana 4B5 assay was the one that was used for the Destiny 04 breast HER2 assessment. And the 4B5 assay is now an approved companion diagnostic for HER2 low assessment by the US FDA. Uh, so that's the only drug that is uh, approved now um, based on the evidence from the trial. In the UK, that's the main one that we use. So most laboratories in the UK use the Ventana 4B5. We still have few labs that use the DACO one, and they also contribute to the NEQA scheme. And um, they do well as well. But I think there is still a lot of work to, uh, to do to see how both tests correlate uh, when identifying this very low level of expression. And NICWAS is working on that at our end and because we receive cases from uh, all labs in the country and all antibodies used and from Europe as well and, and other um, um, non-European countries. So uh, there will be a, a bit of a resource there to see how they do when it comes to the HER2 low and there is now a HER2 low interpretive scheme in the pilot phase. Are there other studies looking at the concordance among pathologists? So if you get a group of pathologists, give them some slides and assess what, how they call HER2 low breast cancer, particularly looking at the 1 plus and 2 plus um, non-amplified. This is a, a recent study published in Modern Pathology, and it's a European study looking at 105 HER2 cases, all selected uh, to be HER2 negative originally, and 16 pathologists looked at them in two rounds. As you see, that was the first round. Actually, in the first round, some cases were called positive, three plus, when the original selection did not include even three, uh, three pluses at all. And they found that when um, they cluster the scoring, so for example, zero versus one and two, or zero versus one versus two and three, they had better concordance. So they sat down, agreed the criteria, and did another round, which showed better concordance, but still overall not great. And the, uh, for round one, for example, the overall concordance on all the scores, uh, that's 0, 1, 2, uh, was only 4.7% among pathologists. So it, it looks a bit complicated because it's not just straightforward and it's not uh, one scenario. So if you look at the guidelines uh, for score one plus, for example, there are six possibilities where you can call a tumor one plus from faint incomplete more than 10 to strong complete less than 10. So, um, and, and two plus, um, uh, strong complete le uh, less than or equal to 10 to weak complete. So all of these are, um, are possibilities for one plus and two plus. So you need to assess intensity and percentage of staining uh, to get the right uh, classification. And I find this uh, role, the magnification role, really, really useful, particularly with the intensity. So if you are low power times four or times five and can see the staining um, that as positive, you're dealing with strong expression. It is not weak. You can see it at a very low power, then this is strong. If you need to go times 10 to identify positive staining, then this is moderate. If you need to go really high times 20 or even 40 
to um, assess the expression, then you're dealing with weak or faint expression. And, we, and the magic number is 10%. Once you decide on the intensity, look for the percentage. So say you called it moderate, look at the percentage of staining. If it's more than 10, for example, that's two plus and so on. So the HER20 currently in the guidelines includes less than 10% staining, weak or faint, and also no staining. No staining is the HER2 null, completely negative, uh, blue staining, no, no brown at all, and the um, less than 10%, which is what we call the ultra low. So the zero would include the ultra low group. So we've recently done a study in the UK, um, and this was um, scored by the National Coordinating Committee of Breast Pathologists in the UK. So those are the expert breast pathologists in the UK, covering all the regions and also in Ireland. Um, and we basically um, scanned uh, slides digitally, um, and we got all the categories, but enriched for the uh, HER2 low group. Um, we felt that it's important to include three plus as well to see how people would, would um, score them. Um, and we took 50 paired H and E and immunohistochemistry sections, digitized them, whole slide scanning, and asked the 16 expert pathologists to um, score them. And we didn't uh, only ask them to say whether they think it's one plus, two plus, three plus, etc. We actually asked them to give all the parameters. What's the intensity? What's the completeness of staining? And what is the percentage to know how they base their final score um, on the parameters? And we looked at the levels of agreement. So if everybody agreed, the 16 agreed, that's absolute 100% agreement. If the majority up to uh, 12 agreed, then this is high concordance. Less than that, we said low. Um, and if less than 50% agreed, it's poor or challenging cases. So this was our cohort and we found that, um, and this is the original uh, classification of, of um, cases, and that's how we interpreted them for assessment. And this was the level of agreement, it's very similar to the European study. So we found that we all, everybody, the 16, agreed only on the three plus cases. Uh, there was a very high level of agreement uh, on the rest, except for uh, five cases where we all call them negative, but the difference between calling them zero and one was a problem. We also found that if we combine categories, so say zero again is the rest, or zero again is one and two combined, we get a higher concordance. So we as pathologists might be really better uh, if, um, if the results of the, um, of the DESTINY 06 trials came back to say, we really don't need to make this distinction, just pick up the zero that no expression at all is on all ones, and we uh, again is the rest. This would be much easier for us to reach a consensus. So we agreed, all of us, on this type of cases. Some cases that caused problems was one like this. Um, and this is according to the UK guidelines would be strong, complete, um, less than 10. So we would call this two plus and fish. Some colleagues would uh, call it two clones, negative and positive and deal with them separately. So it depends on how you, you treat, um, you deal with this case. Uh, but the guidelines would say now call this two plus and fish. And this would then fall under the, um, the HER2 low breast cancer. The challenging cases were challenging in calling them zero or one plus. So they were all negative. Um, and then we rescored those cases. And this is the example of those cases. When you have the majority ne completely negative, and then you have a bit of expression here. And then is it genuine expression? Is it genuine membrane or is it just background cytoplasmic? And then you go a bit higher. Some of it you might actually ignore because it's uh, interstitial, but some is genuine membrane and depends on 
how much you think this is out of the total, is it 10% or less, you would call it either one plus or zero. So these were the cases that we found very challenging. And th these were the reasons of discordance. Cases around the 10% cutoff. Cases were very faint, uh, with, with faint or weak membrane expression, where there was some cytoplasmic background staining, where there was heterogeneity, and there was one case that was a bit blurred on digital imaging, so um, people were not sure whether the 10% cutoff was reached or not. So this um, paper has been just accepted in the breast journal, so it should be available online um, soon. And this is just a, a summary. The challenges with HER2 low breast cancer have been uh, highlighted recently, and this is an example of one paper. Um, just citing the, the, the difficulties, one of them is that the current uh, IHC assays were not calibrated to detect the very low levels of HER2 low. They were designed to pick up the positives. Not, not the low level of expression. So are the current tests reliable for us to, to use for the HER2 low cancer? Uh, ASCOCAP, they recommend that ASCOCAP actually to consider going back to the 2007 definition of HER2 zero, which is no expression whatsoever, which will make life easier for us. Um, there is a need for education for oncologists and for pathologists about this group and the, its importance and the concordance and that we talk to each other and you're doing exactly that, you know, coming together to discuss what's her tool or what to do with it, what's the uh, latest on it. Need for concordance studies and we need clinical practice guidelines to uh, advise uh, oncologists and the MDT team, including pathologists. So these are starting to come now. So what are the latest international guidelines on HER2 low uh, cancer? The UK actually was the first to um, mention the HER2 low category. And these are our guidelines published late last year, December 2022. And this was the first to say that we anticipate that the drug will be available. And once it is approved in clinical practice, the term HER2 low should be included as a descriptive term in pathology reports to include one plus or two plus fish negative. So we in the UK recommend um, categorizing cases. We haven't got the drug approved yet. We're hoping to get it at the end of this year. Uh, it is being assessed by NICE now, but the, our pathology guidelines say once the drug is in action in the UK, pathologists should use this term. So we would say zero or one plus, and if it's one plus or HER2 um, fish negative, then we would call it HER2 long. And the UK guidelines, a really good paper if you want to refer to, actually gives you a diagram, what you would, uh, how, what you do and what you would call HER2 low, what you would call positive and negative. Um, the uh, ASCOCAP guidelines have just published their um, recommendations uh, into, um, into separate journals, actually. But they think that there is still a bit of work to be done on refining the classification and defining what's her too low. And it says, although it's premature to create new result category for HER2 expression, so whether to call them HER2 low or ultra low, the best practice is to distinguish IHC0 from 1 plus, because this is now clinically relevant. So ASCOCAB would not recommend using the HER2 low terminology at the moment, and they await the results of the trials, particularly DESTINY06, to see whether we um, need to use it or not. Recently as well, just come out, the ESMO expert consensus statement on the definition, diagnosis and management of HER2 breast cancer has been accepted. Uh, you will see the paper just in a pre-proof, so hasn't been um, fully uh, published yet. But it's, it's actually useful, a set of questions. It's a consensus among experts, including uh, pathologists and oncologists 
on various issues regarding HER2 lower breast cancer. And one of the questions is how should pathologists score HER2 low expression? And this is a statement. Um, use the ASCOCAP guidelines, use faint rather than barely faint, but they do not recommend that uh, pathologists should use the terminology HER2 low at the moment. Although the same consensus recommends Oncologists use this terminology, which is a bit confusing. It's a bit of, uh, uh, you know, disparity between what's recommended for oncologists and pathologists. So the ESMO um, is awaiting further data from um, trials, uh, would recommend using zero and one plus to distinguish, but does not recommend that pathologists use the term HER2 low at the moment in our pathology reports. And that's what they say, um, the explanation for it, uh, that the um, Destiny Breast 06 is evaluating the role of TDXD beyond what is uh, defined as HER2 low now. So even in zero and, and, and the HER2 ultra low. So this might inform us as pathologists later. And they also talk about this uh, spatial distribution and heterogeneity of HER2 expression that was identified in the DAISY trial. Um, so the role of intratumoral heterogeneity as well. So they await further data before recommending uh, that we use the terminology. So where are we now with the uh, TDXD um, drug approval? Are we already using it? Yeah, it's already being used in the United States and they were the first to approve it uh, following uh, data from the DESTINY-04 trial. And they approved the um, uh, 4B5 um, companion diagnostic for it. So it is being used in this context in the HER2 low category, and it is present in the clinical um, NCCN guidelines in the US. So that's already embedded there. Subsequently, earlier this year, January, it was approved in Europe as well um, uh, for the same indication. So that's for the, in the HER2 low, metastatic or uh, uh, locally advanced breast cancer. So this is the indication, not upfront, not for the uh, primary uh, early stage. It's only for the metastatic. In the UK, um, the drug is approved for the HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer and is being uh, assessed now by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, which is nice to, um, and the, we ex expect the results, the verdict to be uh, by November this year. Um, you may know that in the UK, we do not approve anything. We don't do anything except uh, if NICE approved it. So NICE in, in the UK is like, you know, uh, then, yeah, that's, that's what we go for. That's a standard. And if NICE says that's what to use, every hospital the following day will adopt it. No question. So we expect it to be approved and expected date is November 2023. So is the uh, HER2 low category, is a distinct, is it a, a biological entity? Uh, does it have a particular prognosis? Uh, there is a bit of data in the literature now on this, and many say that it's slightly better in, um, um, in the ER uh, positive um, cancer. Uh, there is a lot of comparison between PCR rate, for example, in the HER2 zero and the HER2 low breast cancer, and they found that there is low level of PCR in the HER2 low breast cancer compared with the zero complete negative. Um, in Austria, registry data, they found that it had no effect on prognosis. In the US, they found that it has better survival in the metastatic setting. Um, and this is um, a late, um, um, a latest meta-analysis on this of 23 studies uh, showing significantly better DFC and overall survival in the HER2 low group in early stage breast cancer. In the ESMO consensus, they said there is no enough evidence at the moment to suggest that HER2 low is a separate biological group and that its prognosis might be based on whether the tumor is luminal, ER positive, or triple negative. So there isn't enough data for now to say that it is um, a definite biological group. 
So how about the evolution of HER2 expression um, in, in breast cancer? For example, between primary and metastatic cancer, post-treatment or between the core and excision, because this will tell us whether we need to repeat testing or not to detect those cases. This is a really nice study in the evolution of HER2 low expression from primary to recurrent breast cancer. Large study, over 500 uh, patients uh, with recurrences or metastases, and they found that the HER2 low in the primary uh, was 34% and slightly higher in the um, metastases. So it was more enriched in the recurrent tumor. It was more frequent in the hormone receptor positive cancer compared with triple negative cancer. Uh, but what's interesting is that they found a discordance that HER2, HER2 expression goes both ways. So there are some cases that were zero on the uh, um, original primary that became HER2 low on metastasis and vice versa. So this indicates that we really need to look at the recurrence and retest it. Uh, but um, they found uh, um, a majority that were HER2 zero sw switching to HER2 low. And this means a new option for therapy for those patients. So that's why it would be advisable to biopsy the metastasis and retest HER2 on it. And they show this nicely by this diagram. So HER2 zero going back to even HER2 positive, going back, uh, moving to HER2 low and vice versa as well. HER2 low becoming HER2 zero. Um, so relapse biopsy may offer a new therapeutic uh, opportunity in a significant proportion of patients. So in metastasis, we generally, the recommendation here in the UK to try to biopsy metastasis, not only rely on the clinical uh, presentation. So first to confirm the, the diagnosis and get tissue to do the molecular markers. So we would repeat ERPR and HER2 testing. And we do other tests as well, like PDL1 for the triple negative, uh, PIK3 kinase mutation for the uh, resistant ER positive. So it is useful to have this uh, biopsy. And there is data in the literature to show that there is a significant change between the primary and uh, metastasis in ERPR and HER2. And as we saw, this applies to her to low breast cancer too. And this is just a, a summary uh, in pathobiology paper to, uh, to show that. So this is some data that we published before on the effect of new adjuvant chemotherapy on her to expression. And we found that you can go both ways. So this was two plus became completely negative after NACT and this was negative became positive after NACT. So you would expect that HER2 low would be the same as well. And we're currently looking at this uh, in detail. Similarly, data shows that new adjuvant endocrine therapy can do that as well. So this is an example of a case that was on core biopsy, completely negative, zero for HER2, no expression, not ultra low even no expression. And after therapy, it was two plus fish negative. So this would be a HER2 low cancer, isn't it? And, and this was zero. If we didn't test this, then the patient wouldn't, wouldn't have the option for treatment. So just a few points to keep in mind. Uh, if you're asked by your clinicians, should we re-biopsy, should we retest? Um, it's useful to get a comprehensive uh, view. This is a new uh, paper, recently published paper, reasonable cohort of patients from a Chinese uh, cohort. Uh, they found that um, the testing on core biopsy on its own is not, uh, not enough because they found a discordance uh, in about a third of the cases. So concordance was 77%, but they found that some cases moved from HER2 low to zero and others from zero to her too low and reasonable proportions. So they also recommend uh, retesting. I think it would be very difficult to retest every, every tumor. Uh, otherwise we will test quite a lot, but at the moment, at least the recurrence 
uh, should be tested because that's that's the indication for therapy. Recurrence and uh, metastatic disease should be retested. So going forward as pathologists, and we have this a new evolving field, there, there is a lot to consider. Um, what's the type of antibody that we use, um, whether you're using DACO or the Ventana 4B5, both are approved, both are, um, um, are useful, uh, as long as you are using your um, common sense, using your controls, using uh, lab accreditation and uh, participating in um, a, a quality assurance scheme, just to make sure that you're getting the right results. We need to uh, discuss difficult cases among each other, and this will include now the HER2 uh, low group, um, to think about metastatic biopsy versus primary testing. And I would say previously, although we were, many of us were still saying zero and one plus, we were not paying much attention. Maybe what we called one plus or zero at that time was not as accurate. So maybe review your previous um, uh, case, if a case came back as metastatic, look at the primary uh, and, and if you have a metastatic biopsy, repeat treatment. Consideration for uh, heterogeneity of workload, obviously this means more work and, and time uh, for pathologists to assess every case. Now you really need to spend the time to look at the expression, intensity, percentage, um, there are other methods being developed for her to low quantifications, mRNA tests, um, and several are, are in the pipeline. Um, and we need guidelines and evidence-based guidelines uh, and training to, uh, to get a consensus and a quality assurance scheme. So going forward, we really now all need to separate score zero and one plus it's no longer uh, appropriate just to say HER2 negative. Um, we, we now need to say this is negative zero or negative one plus and spend the time to get it right. To include uh, controls or cell lines in every batch of staining. So NICWAS recommends using one plus control, which was not recommended before, and also to use cell lines of various staining intensities. Participate in a HER2 uh, scheme, whatever is available in, in your area, or if you want to join the UK one. And there is a lot of work as well now on the use of digital pathology and artificial algorithms to quantify. Uh, AI might be better than us in identifying whether we have 10% above or below, uh, but this still needs to be calibrated against expert pathology opinion. So RNA assays are being done, digital pathology, and ideally we need a response-related test. Uh, just to make it even more exciting, the drug is being tested in different tissues as well, not only in breast, and has shown um, um, survival advantage in all cancer cell types except biliary tract and pancreatic cancer. So endometrial, cervical, ovarian, urothelial, and uh, these showed really good promising results using the TGXD in the Destiny Pan Tumor O2 study. So um, durable response in multiple tumor types. So we might have to assess HER2 in other tissues as well um, and uh, assess the HER2 low category. So just to summarize, we are no longer using the uh, binary classification. Uh, HER2 low, uh, 1 plus and 2 plus fish negative. TDXD is effective treatment of the HER2 low breast cancer, and it's also effective for the 3 plus. Um, we know that. Um, there's little data now in the concordance of pathologists. Um, the UK guidelines recommend using the HER2 low cancers, but the other guidelines do not recommend that for pathologists at the moment. And there, there are now schemes for HER2 low cancer. And uh, that's it. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Abir. I really enjoyed it. Uh, very informative, very detailed, indeed confusing, uh, since we are um, following the ASCO cab. And we see our colleague, as you mentioned, the oncologist using the terminology here too low. But for pathologists, when we read the cab, it's not recommended, not yet. 
So um, I hope we will have uh, an answer soon after these, uh, the trial uh, results um, published. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question myself, um, actually. Uh, it's, um, I always find it challenging when our colleague oncologist asking for the HER2 status in cytology specimens, pleural fluid or acetic fluid. I find it really difficult how to give them the uh, scoring, whether I was accurate or not. So um, this is one question, like how do you deal with similar requests? Yeah, I agree with you. So, um, so cytology is not a recommended method for assessment of HER2 in general. And this is stated clearly in the UK guidelines. We only do it if there is no other sample can be obtained. For example, just patients with comorbidities, the only uh, sample you can get is pleural fluid metastatic and you, you cannot biopsy the patient. So we try to do our best with a cell block. We do cell blocks and try to do it as tissue, but it's not recommended because um, obviously you don't have the, the, the architecture. You, it's, it's, not, it's not easy to interpret. You don't have enough cells there. Yeah, exactly. so, and, and you can refer to the UK guidelines to show that, that it's not the recommended method. Yeah. Unless you're absolutely desperate, you really can't get any tissue whatsoever. Do you add a disclaimer or something when you like had to report uh, her to in cytology? Uh, we we discuss that in the MDT and say that this is not the best way, but mm -hmm. we're doing what we can with the available sample. I mm -hmm. think it just needs some communication with your clinician to mm -hmm. advise them that that's not the best way. Mm -hmm. If you can yeah. get another piece of tissue, that will be best. Mm -hmm. so we, we add that, we comment on that in the MDT. Mm -hmm. um, do we have a question? Because I do have another comment as well. Here we have one question. Uh, if HER2 is a three plus in the initial biopsy, what is the justification for repeating HER2 in recurrence or metastatic focus? Yeah, good question. Um, first, some cases can change, and it's not uncommon. In about 7 to 14% reported in the literature, you get a change from HER2 positive to negative or to HER2 low. So you might wish to use, uh, or your clinician might wish to use that. Then you come to the uh, issue. Um, some studies as well found that the change is prognostic, that patients or tumors that um, change profile, particularly after anti-HER2 therapy, do better, and some said worse, but to do better than those who keep the HER2 positive profile. It also can affect what treatment you are using next. However, as you say, most, most um, clinicians and the consensus is that you treat on a positive result. So if it is three plus, you, even if it changed profile, you generally would continue with anti-HER2 therapy. It's more relevant if it is negative and changed to positive. But now, obviously, we have the HER2 low as well. Um, we also um, test because you can get a change, concomitant change in ER and PR. So say it is HER2 positive was ER negative became ER positive and HER2 negative. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. The other thing is to give you some indication of the potential metastatic potential for this tumor, because this tumor might uh, metastasize later as HER2 negative. And then you have evidence that actually after treatment, it was HER2 negative. Yeah. Um, we don't have other questions, but a uh, comment. Um, uh, we started uh, having or developing our... Um, digital pathology, and we start to digitalize our specimen here at SSMC, and we do have the uh, HER2 alg algorithm, So, but it's, it's still not yet implemented soon, inshallah, within this a few months. So what's your, uh, I want to hear your uh, experience uh, with the HER2 AI. Do you have experience? Is it, um, ha have you like uh, use it yourself or, uh, from your colleague? Is it really useful, consistent result you will get? How about the concordance with the pathologist examining it under microscope? 
Yeah, so we, we are also introducing digital and I think most of the UK labs are trying to digitize their slides now, but not we are not there yet for everything. So at the moment, we, only, we um, score on slides and the UK guidelines still say score on slides. We use um, AI algorithm for fish because we found that it is um, it's very uh, fish manually is time consuming. So we have an algorithm for uh, AI for fish testing that would count the cells, but also still overseen by an experienced by medical scientists okay. or pathologists. So we really have still to have to oversee this and it's useful to have the result, but to double check it as, as yeah. a pathologist. Uh, we think that the HER2 low will be an issue because if we as pathologists cannot standardize it, how can a machine standardize yes, it? Yeah, exactly. it's still, yeah, so yeah. it is useful, but I wouldn't just use it alone. I would still double check it with uh, the pathologist scoring and see if we agree and for the pathologist to override it because you will have some artifacts, sometimes cytoplasmic staining artifacts. Yeah. And they are picked by the machine, but not obviously will be discarded by an experienced pathologist. Another issue is the timing, time as well. Um, because when you digitize, you have, you introduce the scanning method as well. And, and this takes time. I'm not sure how it is at your end, but we are constantly chasing our tails. We're, we're really working super, super fast, yes. particularly to get ERPR and HER2, that no, no uh, window for a delay. We, we're very, very quick. So it's quicker at the moment for us to put a slide quickly, once it's out of the lab, down the microscope and score it, rather than to wait till the slide is scanned and then it appears in your um, mm -hmm. tray in the digital tray to scan it. So I think you have to weigh lots of things, the speed, the quality, um, and, um, and, and audit it yourself as well, I think, when you introduce yeah. a new thing yeah. to see, uh, for example, 100 cases, how many you would agree with the algorithm, how many, uh, how you would refine it, and uh, mm -hmm. then you're, you're absolutely happy with it. So a lot of work, I think, for pathologists, we, we still yeah. have a lot of work to do yeah. on all of yeah. these. Especially in the era of artificial intelligence, is something new, and with all these new algorithms coming, like the PDL one, the HER two, the ER, the PR, it's yeah. still new. I have one question: uh, What about HER two assessment in gastric adenocarcinoma? Should we apply same new guidelines as in breast cancer? No, not yet. <laughs> there is no no guidance. <laughs> no guidance yet for the HER2 low in um, gastric cancer. And as you know, even the standard assessment of HER2 in gastric cancer is different to the breast. So it's yeah. basically any expression in gastric is regarded as positive, while in the breast it's more detailed. So there hasn't been any um, guidance yet on mm -hmm. HER2 low. No, Although with this pan uh, cancer uh, destiny trial, there might be something coming our way soon, but uh, not yet. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Prof. Abir. Thank you for all the attendees who are asking about the presentation. And as like the previous presentations, you can access them at SSMC, Abu Dhabi Surgical Pathology Journal Club. Just Google it and it will come to you, the, the website and all the uh, speakers and the previous lectures. Prof. Abir, I'm really honored to have you today. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. And hopefully we can have more cooperation and collaboration in the future. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you all. Lovely to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.